I know that there's a basketball game going on next <laughs> But I got to say, if that had been a women's basketball game, I would have been in there with all of you. <laughs> but instead, I'm here to talk to you on the subject of Iowa's rebel girl, Pearl McGill, and the promise of inclusive unionism, 1894 to 1924. So that's a long time ago, a century ago, really. And, um, but before I do that, I want to talk a little about my role as the curator of the Iowa Women's Archives. Um, I have, have some, have some or most of you heard of the Women's Archives at the University of Iowa? Okay, so you know that we're a repository that collects and preserves the paper of Iowa women, and that that's a very important thing to do because for so long in history, women were overlooked and really excluded from writing about the past. And I also want to just take a minute so to acknowledge those of you who perhaps donated your papers or records of organizations that you belong to, to the Iowa Women's Archives. Are any of you here who have donated materials? Oh, yay. So, you know, thank you so much for your contributions. They have helped make the IWA the wonderful repository that it is today. And I also know that many of you have contributed financially to the Iowa Women's Archives, and your contributions really do make it possible for the work that we do. Um, and they make it possible for us to make our collections available and accessible to a wide audience of scholars, members of the public who come from near and far these days to conduct research in the Iowa Women's Archives. We're extremely grateful for your support, which really does make it possible to do the work we do today. As many of you probably know, the Iowa Women's Archives was founded 32 years ago as a result of the generosity of two Iowa women um, they had a remarkable vision and incredible generosity. They were Louise Now and Mary Louise Smith. Um, uh, and, you know, so, so their generous contribution to the archives enabled the creation of the archives through an endowment, famously through the sale of Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with loose hair. And a more recent example of the ongoing importance of philanthropy to our ability to meet the growing and ever-expanding needs of the IWA today is the wonderful gift of Jean Lloyd Jones and her granddaughter, Michael Ann and Liz. <laughs> Their gift enabled the creation of a permanent, endowed, women in politics position. And our, we'll, 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 our Women in Politics archivist is Kate Rossum, and she's now in her second year working in the Iowa Women's Archives. And I don't think it could be a more critical moment than today for us to have this wonderful opportunity to have this archivist working full time on collecting materials relating to women and politics. So today, the Iowa Women's Archives is a robust repository holding around 1,400 manuscript collections representing women from all walks of life across Iowa and beyond its borders. And people come from near and far to do research. You may not think that the, the letters and scrapbooks and diaries that you might hold in your possession might be of significance to scholars and researchers, but you'd be surprised what they find and what they use when they come to the archive and delve into these rich collections. So today what I'm going to do is focus on just a handful of letters from a single collection in the IWA that tell the story of the title of my talk, this Iowa rebel girl named Pearl McGill. And I'll be delving into her letters as an example of how archival collections interact and foster historical research. So this is how the letters looked when they were originally donated to the archives. That's an old cigar box that sat on the shelf 
of the family for many years. Um, they were donated to the archives by Pro McGill's niece, Jean Burns, and she gave them to, the, to us after Pro McGill was inducted into the Iowa Labor Hall of Fame in Waterloo at the convention of the Iowa Federation of Labor. That happened in 2006. And when Jean and I returned home, she, um, back to Muscatine, which is where Pearl McGill's uh, lived, she entrusted this box of letters to my care to be preserved in the Iowa Women's Archives. And I did have a compelling interest, bordering on obsession with this collection. Um, and um, in 2011, I entered the PhD program in the history department. While I was continuing to work full time in the archives, I've worked there since 2001. And Shelton Stromquist, professor in the history department, became my academic advisor, and he chaired my dissertation committee. So um, I was very fortunate there. So let's go to learn more about Pearl McGill. One reason Pearl's letters were kept was that she died young in 1924. Newspaper accounts of her death on April the 30th, 1924, told of the murder of a 29-year-old school teacher at the hands of her former husband in Buffalo, Iowa, you know, a little town right on the Mississippi River. The newspaper articles characterized McGill as a typical Midwestern school teacher, active in her church, well-respected in the community. Nothing was said of her earlier role as a militant labor activist, other than a very vague reference that she had, had been a secretary to this famous labor leader, this guy, Big Bill Haywood. Um, and a story. But McGill's letters tell a different story. Through them, and because they were preserved by her family and donated to an archives, we can see what was going on during a very tumultuous period in the U.S. labor movement from the perspective of an outgoing and charismatic teenage woman labor leader. Not all of her letters survived. Not all of them were kept. In the 1950s, her niece, Jean Burns, told me that during the, during the McCarthy era, she had seen her mother burn some of the letters that had the most radical content uh, because she was afraid. And so we're left to consider archival absences and what they mean. What gets saved and what does not survive into the future? Whose perspectives do we engage with and whose are omitted from the historical record? And you know, we all know women's perspectives were always omitted, but this is another layer of omission and perhaps erasure. These observations have led my research and they helped shape my dissertation. The letters reveal that McGill was wise and courageous, that she stood up for what she believed in and became a powerful voice for working people across the country. She fought for decent wages and working conditions and the right for workers to be represented by <coughs> inclusive unionism. And I just will mention this term, inclusive unionism. It's really not as complicated as, as it sounds. It means a kind of industrial union that refers to a broad-based spirit of organizing. And it proliferated during the progressive era between the 1890s and about 1920. It was quite common. And it simply means organizing all workers from a single industry into one union, regardless of race, skill, gender, or ethnicity. So it was a big idea. So here's Pearl. Um, she was born in 1894 in a log cabin on the banks of the Mississippi River in, near Moscow, Iowa. Her family was poor, and she left at home at 16 like many girls, many rural farm girls in Iowa, to go work in one of Muscatine's many pearl button factories. There were lots of jobs there for women. 
In this photo here, oh, I, I know I have this pointer. I'm going to use it. You see that's Pearl standing outside of one of Muscatine's many button factories um, with her fellow button workers. I think that factory was the pioneer button company. So the year was 1910, and this was a period of turmoil in the button industry. It was also a tumultuous time in manufacturing industries across the country. An organizing drive had been going on in Muscatine's button factories for several months. There were about 43 button factories in Muscatine. It wasn't just one factory. It consumed the town. Okay, everybody who lived in the town, the population was about 16,000. About 3,000 people worked in the button factories or had some connection to the button factories. And one third of those workers were women. By the end of February 1911, all but a few hundred workers had signed up to be members of the union. And this made it the largest local union in Iowa with over 2,000 members. This was the power of this kind of industrial unionism. Manufacturers did respond. This did not go unnoticed. They responded to the threat of a unionized workforce by locking all the, shutting all the factories down and locking the button workers out. Mm. And when they reopened the factories a few weeks later, without addressing any of the things that the workers wanted to change, improving their wages and their working conditions. Um, they, they fully expected that the men would not come back to work, but they <coughs> underestimated the women. They thought the women would just come back, but they did not. Much to the manufacturers' surprise, they found a united front of women who, in solidarity with the men, refused to return to work. And so the lockout becomes a strike, involving all 2,400 of the town's button workers, men and women together, and it quickly became known as the labor war of Muscatine. It lasted for 15 months. It actually nearly destroyed the town. Um, so the women were key in the button industry. To give you a sense of how this is not some sort of cute, sort of cottage industry. It's a big deal, okay? This is the McKee and Gliven factory. It's one of the bigger factories um, right on the Mississippi. And here on the second floor, you can go in there and you're looking into the factory and you see these very double, double automatic button finishing machines. Now these are the machines that the women operated. Um, they ran these machines. And what they did was they cut the grooves and patterns onto the blanks from the discs that were cut out of those um, clamshells from the river in one continuous operation. So it was sort of skilled work, but they called it unskilled work because they could pay women less money to do it. But because the machines were so expensive, they cost about $1,200 each at that time, which is a lot of money. Um, they couldn't easily be moved to another location or outsourced. By contrast, the men, this was a gender division of labor in the button factories. Um, the men, they, they cut these blanks out of the clamshells using circular, circular saws. And the work that they did could be sort of outsourced anywhere. So the women were actually critical to the strike. If they went back to work, they could import those blanks from anywhere across, across up and down the river where, where those blanks were being cut. They were cutting shops and plants everywhere. But they couldn't so easily get the work that the women were doing. Done. So, um, so that's why the strike was able to continue and the men recognized the women were the key to the ability to maintain the strike. And so before I go further, I want to just step back and think about what the labor organizations were, were during this period. Some are familiar and some are less so. So first is the American Federation of Labor. Um, this is the union that the button workers were affiliated with their button union. Um, it was founded in 1886. And um, 
The American Federation of Labor, the AFL, represented both craft and industrial workers. They, they were machinists, coal, coal miners, carpenters, and electric, electricians. It, could, it was a broad cross-section of types of work. The second on the list here is less familiar. It's called the Women's Trade Union League. It was founded in 1903. And this organization was devoted to improving the conditions of women workers by helping them organize in order to improve their pay and their working conditions. If you take a look at the logo, their logo you see it says, the eight hour day, a living wage to guard the home. So these are the sort of things that we take for granted today. Um, but these were the things they were advocating for 100 years ago. The leaders of the WTUL um, were mainly upper class women, and they saw themselves as allies of working class women. They had a lot of money, and they poured money into helping organize them. And they had helped the garment workers in Chicago in, and New York during these famous uh, uprisings between 1909 and 1911. It was a period that was referred to as the rising of the women. And in fact, the Chicago garment strike was just coming to a close in 1911 as the button workers' strike began. So the WTUL was working very closely with the AFL, and it was bound by its policies, quite strictly bound by its policies. And it, the AFL dictated which, which workers the WTUL could help and which workers they should stay away from. And finally, at the bottom, we see this other organization, the Industrial Workers of the World, or the Wobblies. This was the radical arm of the American labor movement at that time. It was founded in 1905, and the AFL considered it to be an enemy because it was a rival federation. So Pearl, going back to Pearl, Pearl helps us understand these organizations and see the connection between the button strike in Muscatine and the garment strike in Chicago. All industries where women rose up to demand their rights in this 1909 to 1914 period. So what do we get from Pearl's letters in the archives? A letter really can tell you an awful lot. This is a letter she was writing on, um, the letterhead of her union, which was the Button Workers, it had a proper name, not just the Button Union, it was the Button Workers Protective Union number 12854, and we can see that it was affiliated with the American Federation of Labor, and that here we have Miss Pearl McGill held the elected position of recording secretary in her union. She was 16 years old, um, and we also see that she was one of three women serving on the executive board of her union of 2,000 workers. So with the strike underway, McKill and another woman from the union went to Chicago to raise money to send home to Muscatine to the locked out button workers. And the day before they left, they carried a big banner, there was a big parade through all the streets of Muscatine, and the two girls carried a banner that said, we go to Chicago to tell the story of the button workers. So, here she's writing on a different letterhead. In Chicago, she's connected with the Women's Trade Union League of Chicago, and they're really helping her to connect with the places that she can go to raise money. And the cool thing about Pearl's letters is she tells us what she's doing. How else would we know what a teenage factory worker was doing when she was out on the road and out on strike? Those records aren't going to be in the records of the AFL or other labor organizations. They exist in her personal correspondence that very fortunately survived the passage of time. So in Chicago, McGill was welcomed and mentored by these leaders of the Women's Trade Union League. And in this letter, she wrote home to tell her parents what she was doing while she was out on the road. I'm sure her parents were worried about her. And what was going on with the strike in Muscatine. So this is what she said. 
My dear folks at home, we went to four different unions last night and got about $100 to send to Muscatine for those locked out button workers. We have got about $1,500 or $2,000 since we've been here. So you may know I have talked pretty hard. The manufacturers tried to get us in a trap the other day at Muscatine. They said they would take everybody back to work on Thursday morning. Everyone was tickled to death. Then by Wednesday night, every shop had a bunch of workers blacklisted. They had all the hardest workers in the union on the blacklist. The factory where I worked had the most. They had eight men and me. I was the only girl in the factory they wouldn't take back. And so because they wouldn't take all the workers back, all the workers stayed out on strike in solidarity. And the strike became entrenched as the union tried to negotiate a settlement with the manufacturers that would address the grievances of the button workers. And it went on. Young women button workers like Pearl were on the road constantly giving speeches to raise money to support the strike. And Pearl wrote home from, November, from New York City in November. She said, my dear folks at home, Carrie Cockrell is here now helping me out. We go to three or four meetings every night. Most of them are over saloons or in the back part of them. And I was afraid to go by myself, so I sent for Carrie. We don't care now. I suppose I've been to more saloons and basements and cellars than you ever saw, and all for the sake of the button workers and our union. I got my life insured for $250 in Mama's name <laughs> last week. So if I ever get killed in any of the phrase, or get sick and turn up my toes while I'm gone, it will be enough to ship me back and dig a hole for me in the grand new boneyard, and nobody will need to worry about me. So you get the sense that she is feisty, she has a sense of humor, she has a way of words. And this is going to come into play here. Throughout 1911, Pearl worked closely with WTUL leaders. They connected her with a network of AFL affiliates wherever she went. In addition, they introduced her to progressive society women and philanthropists who were sympathetic to the cause of wage earning women. So another letter, okay. And there you see the logo of the WTUL figure, which is the eight hour day, a living wage to guard the home. So in this letter, Pearl describes a big banquet put on by the League in Chicago in 1911, and she perfectly captures the, the city's spirit of progressivism and the League's approach to bridging class differences. And this is what she says. G. All the dress hats and paint and powder you ever saw in your life was there. The city's mayor's life, wife and some of the big manufacturers' wives and all the aristocrats in Chicago were there. They treat me just like I was as fine as they were. I am right at home here lately with tramps, beggars, millionaires, and common folks. In June 1911, the league really, they did love they did. Um, and in June 1911, they held their biennial convention in Boston. They gave McGill center stage at that convention to tell the story of the button workers. They transcribed her speech in its entirety, featured her in their monthly news letter, Life and Labor. That was a major publication that went out across the country. They featured her several times. And they nominated her to their National Executive Council. And during the convention, on learning that she would turn 17, they celebrated her birthday with a picnic, toasting the girl, and I quote, known to fame as the youthful leader in the strike of the Muscatine button workers. It seemed pretty clear at this time that McGill might well contend for a larger leadership role in the WTUL or even the AFL. But her decision to align herself with that radical organization I mentioned, early, I mentioned earlier, the Industrial Workers of the World in Lawrence, 
would alter that trajectory. So here we go. Here comes the rebel girl. Um, so McGill was at the WT well, headquarters in Boston when the strike of textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts erupted in January 1912. She was out there still raising money for the button workers. This strike erupts. She moved quickly to support 24,000 striking textile workers who had walked off the job protesting short wages. This is the very famous strike that many of you will have heard referred to as the Bread and Roses Strike of 1912. So McGill brought to Lawrence a year's experience of grassroots community organizing, a network of contacts with radical labor leaders. Some were affiliated with the AFL, others were affiliated with the industrial workers of the world. And by 1912, she must have been an inspiring and experienced speaker, ready to provide effective assistance to striking textile workers, many of them young, most of them women. This is a core audience that McGill knew how to relate to. In Lawrence, McGill simply adhered to the principles of industrial inclusive unionism that she learned back home in Muscatine. Consistent with her own beliefs, she immediately offered her support directly to local IWW strike leaders. And just two weeks into the strike, the Chicago Daily Socialist featured McGill in this article titled Girl asserts textile workers to stand for before soldiers. That's the so in the background you can't really see this, but those are horses. The mounted cavalry is back there. This was a battle going on in Lawrence, and people died. And it really, she was really very courageous um, to be as outspoken as she was on for many many different reasons. As journalists flocked to Lawrence to cover the strike, she was very quotable. And they quoted her again and again in the newspapers and, and magazines. So here's the strike. The industrial workers, for all workers organized under the banner of the one big union, IWW, eight hours a day, three, day, three dollars pay, hooray. Um, workers together say, I will win, IWW. Um, so at a March 4th rally in Lawrence, McGill denounced the AFL-affiliated United Textile Workers. Um, this was the craft union that claimed jurisdiction over every, um, all the workers in the textile industry in Lawrence. Um, and I just mentioned that, so this is the United, the UTW, United Textile Workers. There were 24,000 workers in Lawrence. Um, the UTW represented just 250 of those workers, because they were the skilled textile workers, the men, uh, not the women, who they considered unskilled, and they didn't really want them in their union. And so Pearl criticized the leader of the UTW, and she got into quite a bit of trouble for that. Um, what she said, and of course she was quoted, because she says things very, um, she, let's just say she does not hold back. She said, if this fight is lost, and I know it won't be, it will be because the American Federation of Labor is scabbing it. So um, that pretty much sealed her fate. So, so she's, um, just look at another letter and letterhead. This is an interesting one because it's the Hotel Needham in Lawrence. And um, dated March the 5th. 1912, and that doesn't seem too interesting, but on further inspection, it turns out that the Hotel Needham is significant because this was the hotel that was the IWW strike headquarters in Lawrence, and McGill is writing home from that, on that letterhead. This is where famous IWW leaders like Big Bill Haywood and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn um, were staying. And likely from Hill. Um, years later, Gurley Flynn wrote about the Lawrence strike in her autobiography, which she called The Rebel Girl, an autobiography of my first life. And in it, she recalled the socialist girl organizer from Iowa, who had rallied the rank and file in Lawrence. 
At the time of the she, she called um, her. At the time of the strike, McGill was 17. She was just four years younger than the more famous rebel girl, Early Flynn. And here in this letter is how McGill described this strike from parents. She opens the letter by saying, I'm so sorry I didn't write home. You must have worried about me. And she says, my dear mother and home folks, there is a big war being fought here, a battle for bread and a battle for life. The little children of the textile workers were examined by 12 New York doctors who said they were suffering from malnutrition. That means they were like a plant which had grown in the shade. They had never had enough to eat or the right kind of a livelihood to give them health. And they were undersized, underweight, and all the rest. So that is why I did not come home. There are little boys and girls who are loved by fathers and mothers just the same as my own dear little sisters and brothers. Oh, if you only knew how terrible the conditions are out here. I could never tell you all about this big fight for justice and the cause of my class, the working class. After the Lawrence strike, McGill would never again work for the AFL, and she disappears from the records of the Women's Trade Union League. So, So um, I want to go. So now we've talked about these labor organizations a little bit, and um, we followed Pearl through a couple of key years in the U.S. labor movement and into two nationally significant strikes. One of which happened right here in Iowa, the Button Strike between 1911 and 1912, and the 1912 Lawrence Textile Strike. Through her letters. McGill takes us into the heart of both strikes and enables us to understand more clearly the organizations that she worked with. So, um, the WTUL walked the fine line between its loyalty as a non-voting affiliate of the AFL and the demand for working women for new inclusive forms of unionism. Its leaders did understand the boundaries between craft and industrial unions Sanctioned strikes like the Button Strike, and unsanctioned strikes like the Lawrence Strike. And they carefully navigated those boundaries. The Lawrence Strike brought to the surface deep and long-standing fissures in the US labor movement. And you know, the, the Boston League didn't go into Lawrence. They remained silent while that strike was in progress. And it's really not surprising its allegiance to the AFL and its hostility to the industrial workers of the world, which it perceived as a rogue organization, prevented it from supporting women textile workers at the beginning of the strike. It was only after the, the workers' surprising victory in Lawrence that the League would characterize its role there as, I quote, a general smash-up. So I, you know, I was going to talk about the federal labor unions like the button workers, but I think I'm gonna wrap it up there. I, I would be very happy to, um, and, and I'll just conclude with a little bit of what this um, Chrome Guild means here. So this is just a chart that shows the number of button worker locals across the country and how the AFL's policies prevented them from forming national unions. So if you look, whoops, hit the wrong button. This is the first button union formed in the country, formed in Muscatine. It ends in 1903, which is when it tried to form a national union and the AFL wouldn't let it. And then it tries again here in 1909 and comes to an end. And then in 1910, the, the, the button union that Pearl got involved in starts and it, dies out in 1913. So this is what happens when they can't form these national unions in order to fight a nationally organized industry like the button industry that was actually very well coordinated, very heavily financed, and very powerful. So the button workers lost their bid for union recognition, in part because they lacked a national union through which to fight the heavily capitalized, nationally organized, and vehemently anti-union button manufacturers. Nonetheless, the strength of inclusive unionism 
enabled them to sustain a lengthy strike and a bitterly fought battle. The central role of women and particularly the youth, together with crucial support from their communities and the Women's Trade Union League, provides compelling evidence of how inclusive unionism flourished within and alongside the AFL's entrenched craft union ideology. So McKill continued, she's after the Lawrence strike, she stayed out in New England and she continued to work with the radical IWW leaders. She helped with the wave of strikes that followed the successful conclusion of the Lawrence strike. And in 1914, she returned to Iowa and attended the normal school in Cedar Falls in 1914 and she became a school teacher. Although her life was tragically cut short, she is so much more than the tragedy that ended it. Her brief arc to prominence in the national labor movement helps us understand the boundaries of industrial unionism more clearly. Her activism in an industrial union, as an industrial union organizer, exemplifies the broad base of grassroots support for inclusive unionism that existed among a wide range of rank and file workers in the progressive era for which few records exist. By shining a light on what it meant to be a member of a federal labor union, Miguel helps us understand how the thousands of unions like hers, whose records were not kept and disappeared from the historical record, provided a precedent for the successful industrial unions of the 1930s. So. to a neighbor's porch and he shot her and she died. And then he shot himself. So it really is a tragedy and there's not a lot, you know, there's, there's not a lot of evidence. Where can you take that? Do you research more to find out more? I don't know. Um, I, so I, I just prefer to focus on what she did in her life and on her tragic death, really she was a victim of domestic abuse. Um, and that is a tragedy. And she was only 29. Yeah. How long did the button industry last? The button industry was really in full force up until World War II. It was producing pearl buttons made from the clamshells. But if you think about what happened in, during World War II, you get the zipper is invented, fashions are changing, and plastics come in. And so all of those things um, sort of meant that the industry declined. And the other thing that happened was Japan started competing for the production of um, these buttons made from shells. And um, they were producing them more cheaply after the war protections were over. But, you know, the industry stayed and some of the factories that kept going switched over to plastics. And a lot of the buildings are still there, you know. If you go to Muscatine and there's a wonderful um, 
Pro Button Museum, you can go and see how they made the buttons and the machinery that they used. What did she do in Boston before she came back to Iowa? Well, before she came back to Iowa, the from <coughs> the Lord's strike ended in March 1912, and another strike. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Another strike broke out um, in Lowell, which was about five miles from Lawrence, and she was very prominent in the leadership in that strike. Um, working very closely with the IWW leaders. And then there was a wave of strikes that swept through New England as a result of these successes. And she stayed on and worked in those. But there was no clear path for her in the IWW. Um, you know, she needed a way to live. And she ended up actually working in a department store to save money to get back home. You know, it, it, and I also think she was, um, you know, today we'd say that maybe she suffered from PTSD after everything that she had been through. Because she writes about dreams and, you know, things that, you know, are going on. And um, I think it did leave its mark on her, everything that she had been through when she was really so young. And she was, she was alone out there without her family. She did have... Well, after she joined with the IWW, she didn't have the support of the Women's Trade Union League anymore. They had always sort of fostered her and given her a home and a space, and she was without that. And uh, actually, there was another leader of the WT, well, um, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan. She's one who left, and I know that Pearl stayed with her for a bit. She also left the WT, well, because they didn't support Were, were there any uh, letters from her family to her? There were a few, yes. Did the family indicate that they were supportive of what she was doing or warning her to get out of there? What? Well, I think that they were supportive of her, but I think that they were very worried about her. But I think the kinds of letters, well, the letters that survived um, are, are fewer, the letters from her home to her, possibly because of her circumstances out there. But there are a few from her, there's one that I know of from one of her younger siblings. She had these young, much younger siblings. And um, they would, you know, they would write funny things like, my big fat sister Pearl, you know, and, and I don't know, they would, they would, they were just cute, you know, they, they didn't dwell on the dangers of what she was doing. They just sort of tried to, be normal. Um, and she would always, when she wrote home, she'd say, and make sure Donnie keeps up his studies and is, is writing. And, and she wanted them to write to her so that she could see that they were practicing their writing, you know. She was, she was very, she was very much the teacher. She wanted to be the, she, saw, she wanted something bigger. She had a bigger vision of being a teacher in the world. And in fact, one of the things I didn't mention was that when she came back to Iowa and went to normal school in Cedar Falls, um, Helen Keller actually came to speak in Cedar Falls. And she met with Pearl uh, at the train station there. And I'm sure Helen Keller was a radical in her time. And I'm sure that she had met Pearl out east. And Helen Keller wrote to Pearl and said, what, you know, she enclosed some money to help her with her education. And she said, I can imagine what an amazing teacher you will be with your big heart and your wonderful gifts, you know. So she and thought. Did the girl teach? She did. She was teach she was a teacher in Buffalo when she died. That's what she was doing. And according to her niece, Jean Burns, she was probably going to be the principal of the school. But I think in Pearl's mind, when she was younger, she was going to go overseas. She was going to do all these things, but those things didn't happen, you know? Yeah. Is there anything that should be learned from the
She didn't keep any records as a teacher that I'm aware of. Well, you know, if they did, they didn't survive. Oh. You know, I don't know what she kept, but we didn't get any. Um, there are these cute little, um, just the mention of where she went. She went to a one-room school, for sure. And if I just go back through here to the box, oops, there. You see here? There's her souvenir from the Oakdale School. And you know, it kind of says who the kids were that were in her class, all seven of them maybe, you know? But that's it. And I, I'm sure there could be more found out if you went to do some research and look into the schools. And I didn't do that. A few years ago, I had a, a book group who read um, a biography of Pearl Gill. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering how well the was researched. I, I don't recall the name of it. Um, I think it's called Shell Games. Does that sound yes, familiar? Yes, that's the one. By um, yes. Jeffrey Copeland. Yeah. Um, that I would characterize more as a fictional account. Um, he. Well, I know that he sort of creates dialogue rather than drawing, and there are no footnotes. Um, but he does a, a really nice job of looking at the, the development of the um, fishing for clamshells and how that industry all got going. And um, but as far as I can remember, he doesn't get into the strike situation. Um, at all. It sort of stops. So it's sort of odd that that he doesn't deal with that when actually that's she starts working in 1910 and, and this strike starts pretty quickly thereafter. So it's pretty much her entire career is um, caught up in the strike. Yeah. Is there any mention of the women's suffrage movement? Yeah. It's going on. It is. Not so much, no. It really isn't. There isn't a league. They're very, very, you know, parades for the suffrage movement, and um, but not in Pearl's letters or what she's thinking. And I, I kind of find that surprising, actually. But it's not there. Yeah. Maybe we can get this. I don't know. Maybe she was just busy <laughs> doing something else. <laughs> yes. So this is such a remarkable story in so many ways. In the space of two years, yeah. this young girl who goes to work in a cotton factory emerges as this <coughs> voice of labor of workers in a, in, a, in a very compelling and powerful way. How, help us understand what kind of things may have ignited that spirit. I mean, obviously, she was a very special person in a lot of ways. but. Well, what, what crystallized all of that for her? What made her? I think, I think her experience in Muscatine, um, I don't think it happened when she was a child growing up. So that's a real distinction between her and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. She wasn't getting it from her parents. Her parents, they struggled to make a living on a very small farm. And she had lots of siblings. And so they were quite poor. So I just think that she came into Muscatine at a time when there was this, um, this idea of socialism and equality and rights for women workers, and she just bought into it. And she, there were lots of, you know, socialism at that time was quite the norm, actually. Um, the button worker, the, the city of Muscatine elected a socialist to its city council in 1911 and two socialists to the school board, and they were all button workers. So she was working in this environment. Um, the other person she would have worked quite closely with in Muscatine was Oliver Wilson, and he was the socialist who was elected to the city council, and he was the uh, business agent for, for the local. So she was in that milieu. She didn't just, she could not suddenly have picked it up in Lawrence. She couldn't have. She brought it from the Midwest. She brought it from Iowa. And that's why I want to call her Iowa's Gravel Girl. You know? Everybody thinks that interesting things don't happen in Iowa. But Iowa's so fascinating. It's got the best history 
it really does. And we have the best materials in the IWA that tell this history. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's sort of fascinating to me, I spent a year on an organization called Central Trades and Labor oh. in East St. Louis, Illinois, as a result of having been president of the uh, local 434 of the AFT. Oh, okay. And uh, they, one of the requirements, if I was willing to take the presidency then, was to serve on Central Trades and Labor. And it, the whole setup of link at the time tied you into a much wider network mm -hmm. than people ordinarily imagine. You know, it's, it's not just, you know, okay, you're going to help out your local yeah. organization here. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it's not just about that at all. It's a no, bigger world. It isn't about that necessarily at all. Uh, so it, it's fascinating well, to me to see some of this stuff. And you make that good point about the city central, the trades and labor assembly. These were existing back in the, you know, this period that Pearl was working in. And she, this is the organization that propelled the button strike. So even though you know, it, it, it represented all the different types of workers in the community and it brought them all together. And so it wasn't just the button workers and Pearl out there on the road supporting the strike. It was all these different labor organizations. The They're helping each other. And you could pull on, you could draw on all of the organizations just by putting out a couple of feelers and letting them know what was being done. And you could get back in from looking as well. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a powerful experience. I had no clue until I actually did it. And, uh, no so it would have been inspiring, really, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's what inspired Pearl as well. You know, she yeah. just was in, in the midst of all of that going on around her. And the League, the Women's Trade Union League, was also doing its kind of networking for the working class, right? That's right. <laughs> it's some labor, it's yeah. Yeah. And what's central? Uh, you know, all you had to do was was pull, and uh, there were part of the problem was that at least where I was, there were ties to not exactly organized crime, but uh, very powerful labor leaders who had some issues other than just your organization, uh -huh. and so you had to be kind of careful about what you did and what you said. Uh -huh. who, who support you accepted. Right, right. But, uh, yeah. yeah you, you would draw on a, a great deal. Just very powerful support if you needed it. Yeah, and that would make all the difference in terms it of make all the difference. whether you succeeded or failed. There, you know? uh, It just catch fire, and then the doors are locked. 
Because they were afraid the workers would steal. And they locked the doors? Mm -hmm. They locked them in. Is there any other question?